one of the things I really enjoy about running this channel is the chance to connect with other toy collectors and see the comments and mail that I get from them. And sometimes the mail I get is from other YouTube sites, which is really cool because I think it's fantastic that we have this community of online toy content, especially when there's not much other content coming these days. So uh, Analog Toys, I, I've I'm absolutely have visited their channel. They do a lot of uh, very similar things that we do on Spectra Creative, talking about scale and talking about the history of mail-away figures. So they wrote me a letter asking me about, uh, well, sort of my credentials as a lifelong collector and whether or not this was, you know, a front for, for sometimes some of the information I'm giving. And I was like, yeah, I'd be happy to come on your show and discuss this. So I wrote back. And unfortunately, after an email or two trying to find a time slot that worked for us, I hadn't heard back from them at all. So you know, I definitely you know, gave them a couple weeks. But at this point, I figured, hey, I've been asked you know, about my credentials by a legitimate fan site. And you know, that's basically why I do this channel, is to clarify questions about the toy industry. And if it's a direct question about me, I'm happy to do that too. So... Still happy to connect Analog Toys, um, you know, and be on the show. Tony is the one who runs it. But uh, to recap the letter that he wrote me, uh, what he said was, Hi, Scott. I'm intrigued by your constant posturing as a lifelong collector, which you mention in many of your videos in an attempt to make the audience think you are just like them. However, several of you seem to clearly be about supporting the toy company, and I would really like to understand and clarify which camp you're in. If you're willing, I'd love to have you on the Analog Toys YouTube channel to discuss this in further detail. So, like I said, Bruce, I'm more than happy to come on your show anytime. Just, again, let me know when a good time is. I hadn't heard back from you. And since some time has passed, I figured I'll answer the question here on my channel. So, what you're basically asking is the secret origin. Am I legitimately a collector, a toy geek, a comic book geek, movie geek, sports geek? Okay, I'm not a sports geek. But yes, no, I think it's a totally legitimate question because I do come across explaining a lot of things about toy companies. So let's go back in time. So I started off in Cheshire, Connecticut. Well, I was actually born in Norwalk, but that's where we live, Cheshire, Connecticut, for the, until I was 9, 10, 11 years old, something like that. But yeah, playing in Cheshire, Connecticut with my best friend Sean and his little brother uh, uh, Evan in the front there with us with our He-Man toys on our heads. Yeah, toys were a big part of my childhood. But then in third grade, we moved from Connecticut all the way across the country to California, to Orange County. And this was definitely a culture shock. Obviously, it was a little different from Connecticut. Everybody had, you know, sunglasses and tans and ate frozen yogurt, which I'd never heard of before. And everyone in California, at least all the kids, seem to be obsessed with uh, TNC Surf Company and their, like, crazy mascots of the mid-80s. You know they made a video game out of these characters? That's crazy. Anyway, so one of the awesome benefits about being in California was I had access to the beautiful summer camps, and summer camps I did. So I spent quite a few summers at Wilshire Boulevard Temple's Camp Hess Kramer in beautiful Malibu, and definitely some of the best summers of my childhood. Absolutely. I mean, it's where I had my first kiss. It's where I had my first barehanded strangulation. There's just so much that you get to do at summer camp that is very different from, you know, I think school and, you know, it's like a home away from home. And here in the cabins, this is where I had my first comic book experience. Unfortunately, the camp at this point is no longer there because unfortunately a homeless person set it on fire and it burned down. Ah, but the memories are still there. So, Box of comics. From that box of comics, my grandfather sent me Iron Man 203. So uh, a friend of his, Ivan, yeah, the guy's name was actually Ivan. That's kind of funny. Sounds like a supervillain. Um, but yeah, his, his old friend Ivan left a box of comic books in his basement, and he grabbed a bunch and sent them to me at summer camp because he thought, hey, Scott would enjoy these. And this was the very first comic book I ever got or received. So... After getting back from summer camp, I was intrigued because I enjoyed what I read and uh, you know, I thought Iron Man was pretty cool. So I headed over to our local comic book shop, which at the time was called Metropolis, but there was a local uh, club in, <laughs> in the same shopping center, actually, also called Metropolis. Why you would have two things in the same shopping center with the same name doesn't matter. But the point is the club made them change their name. So they became Planet X Comics. 
And then they changed their name again to Alakazam Comics. So whatever. But the point is when I first went there was when they were called Metropolis for like the first year. And it was actually where my first job was I worked for this comic book shop uh, for about three years when I was like 12, 13, and 14, something like that. So there I was, Metropolis Comics, walked in after just experiencing one Iron Man comic my grandfather sent to me at Sleepaway Camp. And uh, I vividly remember seeing both this Eclipso issue, number one, as well as a very weird Flaming Carrot comic book. And this was like, wait, there's other characters besides Batman and Spider-Man out there? At the time, I, you know, I didn't know much. Seeing characters like Flaming Carrot and Eclipso, I was like, wow, I, I want my own hero. Like, I don't want to just follow Superman or Batman or the Hulk, Spider-Man. I want a character I can call my own. I was really passionate about that. So the uh, proprietor, proprietor of the comic shop, whose name was Tong, a very nice guy. He was my first boss, too, when he hired me. So he recommended two titles to me. Uh, one was Deathlock, and the other was Darkhawk, issue six, stating that even though it wasn't the first issue, it was still pretty early in this guy's run, and if I was looking for my own superhero to get behind, someone who's new, they would be good. Well, I picked those up, plus I also dug around, and since I did like Spider-Man and had heard of Spider-Man from Spider-Man and his amazing friends and, you know, culture in general, and so I picked up this issue, which uh, was really cool, because if you don't know, Amazing Spider-Man 346, which is right in the middle of Eric Larson's run, after Todd McFarlane did his famous run, kind of introducing Venom. But this is where we learned that green puffs are available in tricks. We also got a great Spider-Man story. I mean, this was a classic. This was Spider-Man and Venom on the beach, when Venom thinks Spider-Man is dead and decides to stay there. So... At the time, I didn't know this was going to become a classic story, let alone valuable back issues. These were just my first purchased Spider-Man comics. So, you know, I picked up a couple issues in a row, and I read them, and I enjoyed them. Turns out these were also the origin of uh, Carnage were in these issues. So, yeah, hey, good random Spider-Man comics to have picked up. I got quite a valuable uh, little loot. But as much as I enjoyed them, I really did dig the whole Darkhawk character. I like Deathlock as well, but... It, the story kind of died off for me after a few issues. Dark Hawk, however, fit the bill. He was everything I was looking for to become a new comic book geek. He was an original, brand new character for this generation. He had really cool powers where he could transform from human to android body form, and he had a cable claw, and he had glider wings, and shoot blasts out of his amulet on his chest. Very cool. And he was a street guy. He was, you know, this was not like a cosmic character, so you could really relate to him because he was in high school, much like Peter Parker in the 1960s. So, yeah, Darkhawk was very much like that teen hero for the 90s that I was really excited, I'm going to be first in line, and I was, bought all the back issues and, you know, behind issue six so I could catch up, and I was like, all right, this is going to be my guy. I'm going to read Darkhawk, and he's going to be, you know, my personal superhero. And it did last for about 25 issues before they changed his costume and his powers and his reason for being and totally changed who his character was. That's a video for another time. But the following summer, now at summer camp, now that my parents knew I liked comics, they said they thought they would send me some, in addition to my grandfather. So they went to Planet X Comics, or Metropolis, whatever it was called, and they asked for something that I would really enjoy, and uh, Tong had recommended Silver Surfer 50, well, wound up being 49, 50, and then the first two issues of Infinity Gauntlet. So, uh, specifically because this comic involved, like, all the characters. So he thought, you know, oh, yeah, your son's got to like this. It's got all the characters in it. Little was I to know that this was going to blow my mind and become one of the definitive comic book stories for Marvel of all time. But, yeah, here I was at summer camp just drowning in this amazing material. The fact that it was going to go on to become the framework for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I never in a million years imagined I'd get to watch that on screen. So returning from summer camp, we were now kind of in the uh, the time of the X-Men and the Chromium Age, and this was when most of Marvel's big stars broke off to form Image Comics. I'm not going to go into the whole thing here, but essentially Marvel and DC being a whole comic book universe that already existed, since I was already in this framework that I wanted to sort of be behind the latest, coolest thing. Well, Dark Oak was cool, but Image was ten times cooler, because this was getting in on a brand new comic book universe from ground zero. So I was like, all right, I've been a Marvel guy, but I'm, I'm going to pick up all these image books to see which ones I like. And I did. I got every issue number one from the uh, the first year or so, even you know the first two years. 
Savage Dragon, oddly, I didn't pick up till issue two, and that one became the longest running uh, comic that I've collected. But odd that I never picked up issue one. I guess issue two just spoke to me with the uh, cyborg super patriot bursting out there behind him. And one of the things I really liked about Image at first was all the cross continuity and all the ways different characters actually, even though they were owned by different creators, there was a shared universe, such as Chapel from Youngblood, Rob Liefeld's comic, who was revealed to be the assassin of Al Simmons and Spawn, or the company behind Cyberforce, Cyberdata, was the company that rebuilt Super Patriot, and Super Patriot could battle a Youngblood character, Die Hard here, so you had an Eric Larson character and a Rob Liefeld character battling each other, or, you know, same thing, Shadowhawk from uh, Jim Valentino. So it was really cool that there was this cross-connection between the characters, even though they were creator-owned, but... As with a lot of great things, things do fall apart, and unfortunately, the great shared universe that was to be the Image comic universe was not, and slowly but surely, everyone kind of went off in their own direction to do their own thing, which, again, totally cool. When you own your own characters and your own company, you can do that. Jim Lee, of course, everyone knows, went over to DC to become their editor-in-chief and brought with him the Wildcat characters and sold them to DC where they created the Wildstorm imprint. So Wildcats is now printed by DC Comics. And Todd McFarlane, while I'm a huge fan of his pencils, he uh, stopped drawing to do comp uh, uh, sorry toys, comic books. He went from comic books to toys. Although i got to give him credit, he's the one who started me on adult collecting with this very figure. So bravo, Todd, for really redefining the action figure industry. Hey, if you're not going to do comics, at least you're doing awesome kick-ass toys. So I was still happy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, even though I only got into Savage Dragon with issue two and missed the first one, I was hooked, and this wound up being the one I read long term. Probably attracted to him because he's really a superhero dinosaur, if you think about it, even though, spoiler alert, he's actually an alien. But, you know, I mean, he looks like a, he looks like a dinosaur. If you were going to say, you know, uh, give me a dinosaur superhero, you're probably going to think of Savage Dragon. And the reason I stuck with it for 30 years is, Eric has, too. It's really cool that he's the only original Image Comics creator who has done this book nonstop for 30 years. So the continuity is ridiculously tight. The artwork is awesome. The surprises are amazing. I've done a whole video uh, talking about why I love Savage Dragon. I mean, any character that can beat his own uh, arch enemy with, <laughs> with his own arm, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty crazy. I've never seen that before. So, yeah, I was in. Dragon became my guy. And when he got the toy from Legendary Heroes, I must have bought like five or six of this guy. I mean, toys and comic books coming together for me, that was magic. That's when I really found my groove and realized I'm a toy and comic book guy. That's That was sort of my geekhood. Toys eventually just sort of came first. And I think the real big turning point was Power of the Force 2 in 1995. So I was already starting to turn towards the geek side with my introduction to Image Comics and Darkhawk and all that, Infinity Gauntlet, but the Power of the Force 2 collection is what really sucked me into toy collecting. I thought I would get one, maybe two. Chewbacca was actually the first figure I got, but yeah, after uh, one or two, it suddenly became one or two hundred, and then a couple thousand, and now I have an entire room in the back of my office with tiny sliding drawers. In each drawer are Star Wars figures from Power of the Force through whatever figure came out last week. I think Bib Fortuna from the Vintage Collection. So yeah, they're all in their own drawer with an accessory so I could find them. One day I'll have space to display them all. I only collect original trilogy figures, but it has still added up over the years to several thousand figures. So one day I will have a giant shelf with all of my Star Wars 3 and 3 4. Until then, I settle for things like displaying the ones I like the most, like Rebel Pilots, which is really cool because they've done almost every Rebel Pilot that has had screen time in the original trilogy. Or put in together, I have the Cantina or Jabba's Palace. I have little displays. So while I can't have everything out, I'm definitely sort of a toy-first guy when it comes to something like Star Wars. Well, this pretty much brings me kind of to the end of my childhood, adolescence, and the start of my, I guess, pre-adulthood, teenhood. And these were the years that really sort of, you know, changed me from being a, a kid to a collector. I think the last two things that kind of tied it all together were the Star Wars Decipher card game. It really introduced me to the wider Star Wars universe that everybody had a name and backstory, even uh, Dejas Purr from the Cantina, who we called Star Trek Guy. Go ahead, look him up. You'll see why. And then there were the special editions. That was sort of the, uh, I would say, the end of my childhood and the beginning of my adulthood as a toy collector was, was, the, was the Star Wars trilogy. 
special edition. And uh, it's cool that Star Wars sort of began my toy collecting as a small child and, and was there to really kick off my adult collecting. And that, my friends and analog toys, is my secret origin. So I hope that uh, that explained it. I'm definitely not a shill for the toy industry, even though I do explain things. It's because I actually you know worked in the toy industry. So that's where it comes from. I promise I'm not faking it. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much. Watch, share, like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a great rest of your day.